a couple of weeks ago, a student asked a question. Uh, she had been watching this video on local and global feedback. This is part two. There's a part one. The question she asked was, she understood how feedback can reduce distortion, but is there are there uh, situations under which uh, feedback can make distortion worse? In other words, can introduce distortion. <clears throat> and of course, she was talking about negative feedback, and that's all we're talking about here. Positive feedback is a different issue altogether. Uh, if you're interested in th that sort of thing, you might want to watch my video on the Colpitz oscillator and the conditions for oscillation and those sorts of things. But with respect to negative feedback, does it always reduce distortion? And the answer in general is yes, uh, it, it does. But it reminded me of something that uh, a big debate that occurred back in the 1970s or 60s, I think it was the 70s, uh, it may have begun earlier than that, about the effect of negative feedback itself introducing distortion into amplifiers. And the reason that it uh, triggered something is there was a rather famous personality from that period named uh, Peter Baxendahl, famous for inventing the uh, feedback tone controls that were popular back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Still are, for that matter. He made a lot of money off of them because I think he patented the circuits. Anyway, reminded me of that. And so in my spare time, I began kind of looking around to see if I could find the articles that uh, I remember reading back then on this issue. And eventually, uh, I did. So let me show you the, the one of the articles that I came across. Here is one of the articles that I came across. It's the fifth in a whole series that appeared in Wireless World, this particular one in the December 1978 edition. And what it really talks about is this issue of whether or not negative feedback can, in some cases, introduce distortion. And to sort of understand what they're talking about here, let me go back to a diagram that is a copy of something that we've looked at before, having to do with uh, the various forms of feedback and so on. And in this diagram, the input signal, and assume it's a single frequency, is input to a comparator. The comparator compares the feedback through the, the B network, which takes the output from the A network. It compares that to this signal and produces a signal that attempts to make the output of the amplifier an accurate reproduction of the input. And of course the gain of the overall system is going to be determined by the gain of this forward stage and the gain of this feedback stage. Now assume for the present that the amplifier without any feedback contains some second harmonic distortion. And this was the assumption that Baxendale made as well. And the reason is that triodes of the day, that is vacuum tube triodes, tended to produce second harmonic distortion, generally not third harmonic themselves. Furthermore, by the time Baxendale had been had worked some of this out, transistors had somewhat taken over and he had noticed that uh, field effect transistors also produced a very similar effect to triodes, that is a second uh, harmonic component. So the question he was asking was, when you feed that signal back to the input, remember now it not only contains F, but the feedback also control contains 2F. So when you feed back that, you will get an output 
that now will produce a third harmonic. The reason is this 2F signal will mix with this F signal and this F signal and produce F plus 2F, that is in the frequency domain, which is of course 3F, or third harmonic. Well now you have third harmonics on the output, and you feed those back, you get fourth harmonics, and you feed those back, you get fifth. Actually, when you feed back third harmonics, you get uh, second harmonics, uh, I'm sorry, third harmonics from adding F to 3F, and you also get fifth harmonics from adding 2F to 3F. Well, uh, enough of the mathematics. The whole idea is that you have a, a system now that appears to be introducing more and more distortion. And so the question that Baxendell asked himself was, can I model this? And the answer he came up with, with was yes, but he first had to change the model he had for field effect transistors. The, in, in the day, the model for field effects was that the mutual conductance or the transconductance of a field effect was proportional to the square of the drain current. It's called a square law transfer characteristic. And what he found is that isn't really true. And it's important to understand the transfer characteristic of this part, and also of this, but this is usually just a resistor network, so its transfer characteristic is linear. But if you don't understand the transfer characteristic of this, it's hard to predict mathematically what will happen in this network. So he, uh, two of the things that he did in this article, one was to develop a slightly different model for field effect transistors. And what he was trying to do was to determine the difference between the straight line response and the actual curved response or nonlinear response of amplifiers like field effects and uh, triode vacuum tubes. Eventually, though, what he concluded was that the effect is relatively minor. Let me go over one more page here. Well, actually, maybe I'll have to go over one more page still. Yes. To this diagram. And I'll show you a little bigger picture of that in a minute. But basically, this is the results that, that he came up with once he had developed a little better model for field effect transistors and, and triode vacuum tubes. Now, I've copied this out of another source that talks about somewhat the same thing, and I've drawn on it. This top line is second harmonic, the, this, this curve is third harmonic, and by the way, the difference is one of these is predicted from the model and the other is actually he measured in, in his lab. And then fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic, sixth harmonic. Now, what does this all mean? Well, over to the right, this is without feedback. And what he found is that when you apply feedback more and more, the uh, uh, second harmonic component declined. And you would expect that, just as we saw when we did the... Uh, the feedback experiments with the crossover distortion. Uh, the second harmonic component declined as a proportion of the total signal. But what he also found was that although theoretically the third harmonic, the fourth, and so on are present when you introduce distortion, you notice with no distortion the third harmonic component that he uh, actually measured was very low. As he introduced more uh, feedback. Now, feedback is, this is no feedback. This is 40 dB of feedback. So it starts here, and initially the distortion goes up, and then as you increase the feedback, it, as a proportion of the total signal, it goes back down again. So what does all this really mean? Well, what he concluded was, and, and by the way, this is logarithmic, it's basically uh, like the human ear. It's a logarithmic response. And what he discovered is that the third harmonic 
at almost any level of feedback is sufficiently below the second harmonic that it's, it's essentially indistinguishable. And of course even more so for the fourth and fifth and sixth. So while he discovered, and this is mathematically correct, that there is some additional distortion introduced by feedback in an amplifier in which the only distortion in the forward or open loop amplifier is second harmonic, it's really negligible. Now, of course, if you have an amplifier that has a, a high tendency to intermodulation distortion and so on, this your curves might look a little different than this. It, but the amplifier that he was using had a 7% total harmonic distortion, or almost 7%. So, I mean, it was a pretty bad forward amplifier. What we're talking about there is this. The actual characteristics of this amplifier contained 7% total harmonic distortion, even if you did not have feedback. When you applied feedback, the total harmonic distortion went down. And he discovered that the other components introduced by the feedback were negligible. And so eventually, Vaxendahl, partly because he was such an influential figure, was able to put to rest an argument that had been going on for some time. Now, the, because this occurred some time ago, there may be people who are coming to amplifiers and feedback for the first time and may not be aware that a lot of these issues have been debated and in many cases like this one essentially put to rest. So I bring this up because if you come across an interesting question like the student did uh, in the case of the feedback video, it might be a good idea to go back and do some research. Now the bad news is it took me two or three weeks to find this article, even though I knew it existed. So uh, the, the research task is not necessarily uh, an easy one. But uh, we, we learn from the past, and a lot of the issues that are re being redebated today are actually just recreations of issues that have been debated and in many cases put to rest years ago. Well, I, I realize this may be a somewhat off-topic thing for people that are interested in things like the, the analog discovery and so on. But for those of you that are interested in amplifiers and negative feedback and so on, I just thought it might be a, a worthwhile topic to, to talk about. So once again, hope you enjoyed it and hope you also have a nice day.